In her childhood, she was teased for her unusual name, but in the future, it would become a brand and a synonym for success. She sang in various bands, experienced failure after failure, and started a solo career with a big misfortune. Today, she holds the absolute record for the number of Grammys won. Why do celebrities dislike her so much? Why did she fire her father who made her famous? And does she really belong to the Illuminati? You're on the Enco Stories channel, and today we have a complete story of the life and work of the R&B queen, Beyonce. Get ready, you're about to embark upon an interesting journey. So let's get started. Beyonce Giselle Knowles was born on September 4th, 1981 in Houston, Texas. Family plays an extremely important part in the life of our heroine. Her parents supported her from early childhood and went through not the best times so that their child could devote herself to creativity. That is why you need to know about her mother and father first. Her mother, Tina Knowles, was born in a fairly wealthy family and financial freedom allowed her to devote all her time to creativity. While still in high school, she became a member of a musical trio called the Veltones. Together with their mother, they sewed costumes for the band, but a vocal career did not develop. Tina changed several bands, then entered college primarily to leave her hometown for several years. She worked in a fitness center, but at the same time she was engaged in clothing. She sewed costumes for sale, for friends, and for herself. It's this activity that would be decisive. Many years later, she would become famous for the stage costumes that she would create for her daughter and would found her own model agency. Beyonce's father, Matthew Knowles, grew up in a poor family where seven children and two parents survived on $30 a month. As a teenager, Matthew worked as a truck driver and was also a volunteer firefighter. In 1972, there was even an article about how Matthew carried a person out of a burning building. After college, Matthew worked for companies that sold insurance, counters, and medical equipment for early detection of cancer. The talent for sales was obvious. In the early 80s, Matthew drove a brand new Jaguar and earned a six-figure salary, which was incredible for a black boy in Texas. Matthew and Tina met in 1978. She worked as a secretary for a credit card company, and he sold copiers. They met at a party and agreed that Matthew would meet her at the office the next day. When Matthew came for the date, no one showed up and he decided that she had lied to him and given the wrong address. It turned out that he came to the Visa office and Tina worked at the MasterCard company. They met by chance, and only a year later, and a year later, they got engaged. Like all couples, Matthew and Tina entered their marriage full of hopes and dreams, but things went wrong from the start. The day before the wedding, Tina's father suffered a heart attack. Of course, it overshadowed the event, but the ceremony still took place. The honeymoon had to be canceled because they were late for their plane, and then they learned that their father had gotten worse and had been transferred to the intensive care unit. A few days later, Matthew's grandfather died. And that's not all. After the funeral, Tina's grandfather learned that her mother was also admitted into intensive care. Besides family problems, there was the issue of finances. Matthew was not yet earning six figures, and Tina had to quit to care for her mother. Six months later, her mother died, but Tina could not immediately return to work. Instead, she entered a beauty school and soon found out that they were expecting a child. The marriage was on the edge, and Tina even thought of leaving her husband. She was stopped only by her pregnancy, as well as the fact that she had no money of her own. Nevertheless, Tina decided to give this relationship a second chance, especially when after graduation, she took out a loan and opened a beauty salon in her home where she started doing hair. Now she had her own business and was expecting her first child. Beyonce Giselle Knowles Carter was born on September 4, 1981 at Park Plaza Houston Hospital. Tina and Matthew agreed that she would choose the child's name and he would choose her middle name. Beyonce comes from Tina's middle name, Beyonce. I can't describe the excitement I felt as a father, holding her for the first time. Everywhere I'd go, I would take Beyonce with me. It was kind of an automatic duo. Almost immediately after the birth, Tina focused on her own business and her mother-in-law helped them with the child. The salon was called Headliners. Business was slow, and at first the staff consisted of only Tina, her niece, and one other employee. However, Tina worked hard and saw her clientele grow steadily. Her main goal was to become independent in order to have more options in life. When Beyonce was still very young, she already helped her mother in the salon. She swept hair, entertained clients, and received a salary for it. She put aside money and spent it on a subscription to an amusement park where she loved riding roller coasters. In 1986, another child was born to the Knowles family, a girl named Solange. The first school years from the first to the eighth grade were not easy for little Beyonce. 
The main reason for bullying was too light of skin. Sometimes she would come home from school in tears and say she wished she was much darker. She was also teased for her unusual, almost exotic name, and also for her apparently large ears. The result of school bullying was that the girl became incredibly shy and reserved, and this trait did not disappear even at home. I was bashful because the kids picked on me, and I was then picked on because I was bashful. But no matter how bad the day at school was, Beyonce always sang something at home, and sometimes arranged concerts for her parents. After listening to her singing, Tina began to think that maybe her daughter had some talent and that it could be used to help her get rid of her shyness. The first decade of her life was devoted to dreams. Because she was an introvert, Beyonce didn't talk much as a child. I spent a lot of time in my head building my imagination. She remembers. I'm now grateful for those shy years of silence. Being shy taught me empathy and gave me the ability to connect and relate to people. I'm no longer shy, but I'm not sure I would dream as big as I dream today if it were not for those awkward years in my head. When Beyonce was seven, Tina signed her up for dance lessons. The world has a lot to thank Beyonce's dance teacher, Darlette Johnson, for. It was she who saw the talent of a seven-year-old girl. Once, the teacher was singing a song and Beyonce suddenly joined her. I was blown away by her voice. I asked Beyonce to sing it again, but she was very shy and refused to sing. I promised her a dollar if she sang again, and she did. It was Darlette Johnson who persuaded Beyonce to take part in the talent contest. Parents, teachers, classmates came to her first performance. Shy in life, but free on stage, Beyonce began to sing, and when she finished, she heard her first round of applause and won her first singing competition. Shortly after that, Tina began to regularly enroll her daughter in children's beauty contests. All of them consisted of two elements, actually a beauty contest and a talent contest. Beyonce enjoyed the competition part of these shows, but hated the beauty segments. On the other hand, it taught her not to be afraid of competition. Often at such competitions, Beyonce was the only black girl, and it was then that she began to understand that she had to dance and sing twice as much. The girl quickly realized that if she wants to win, she must possess the stage, intelligence, and charm. In 1988, when Beyonce was seven years old, she won the Baby Junior category at the Sammy Awards. It was a tribute contest to the great pop artist Sammy Davis Jr. A year later, in the fall of 1989, she returned to the Sammy Awards ceremony, but not as a contestant but as a guest performer. The most interesting thing is that Beyonce constantly won in such competitions, but at school she did not dare to tell anybody about it. She was afraid that she would be mocked even more. Also at these competitions, the girl did not talk about what was happening to her at school. For many of her classmates, it was a surprise when they saw Beyonce on the screens after many years. She seemed to lead two different lives. Denise Seals and Deborah Lede were people who were always on the lookout for young talent. Together, they founded the company DND Management and were passionate about the idea of making a children's band. When they placed an ad in the newspaper, they received hundreds of offers because every parent thought their child could sing. But one day, Deborah got a call from the same Darlette Johnson, a dance teacher, who told her about eight year old Beyonce Knowles and invited the woman to her next performance. It turned out that the teacher praised her student for a reason. As soon as Beyonce opened her mouth, Deborah and Denise knew they stumbled upon a real find. After the performance, Deborah and Denise found the girl's parents and Beyonce herself, got to know them, and offered their child a place in the new band. The future band was to be called Girls' Time. In spirit, it was to be something like In Vogue or Supremes, but with children in the main roles. Adults exchanged phone numbers only after Beyonce gave her consent. A week later, there was the audition where the children literally waited for hours for their turn to demonstrate their talent. As a result, there appeared three bands which should perform in one show, M1, Girls' Time, and Destiny. Beyonce, as promised, got into the band Girls' Time. Besides her, there was also 10-year-old Stacey Latoyson and 11-year-old Jennifer Young. Destiny included Latavia Robertson and Chris Lewis, and Deborah's daughter performed solo in the band M1. The debut performance in 1990 was attended by 2,000 people, which testified to Deborah and Denise's considerable talent in spreading information. The performance was successful, so the following stages increased in size. Beyonce was only nine years old. The show given by these children's bands was called Ultimate Masterpiece, and although they were almost successful with this program for six months, the show needed improvement. The fact is that not all children were ready for show business and changes, or rather, layoffs have begun. Beyonce coped with her role perfectly. Everyone was fired from the band except her 
and she started looking for new partners. When her talent became apparent, the idea was to create a band around Beyonce, where she would be the central figure. For this purpose, 10-year-old Kelly Rowland was invited to the band. She was shy and insecure, but had a clear voice and sounded like a young Whitney Houston. Also in the new lineup was 11-year-old Ashley Davis, who had a strong voice which she could control perfectly. In this way, the new version of Girls Time was formed. Three singers, Beyonce, Kelly, and Ashley. Hip-hop artist Latavia Robertson and two more dancers, Nikki and Nina. The routine of these children was very different from the routine of their peers. They would come home from school and then immediately go to rehearsal. Quite often, school was not part of their plans at all. Of course, they couldn't help but like it because everything turned out for the best. In 1991, Beyoncé graduated from the fourth grade at the Parker Elementary Academy, which was created specifically for students who were interested in music and achieved success. However, this school also had certain problems. For example, the director of the school choir constantly complained to her parents about Beyoncé because she did not want to participate in the choir. Even then, she was too much of an individual performer to sing with a lot of other teenagers. Sometimes she was given solo parts, but Beyoncé completely ignored both rehearsals and performances. She always wanted to sing, if not alone, then with one or two other people, but certainly not in a choir where her individuality could not be noticed. In the end, her parents took her out of this school, and from the 5th to the 7th grade, Beyoncé attended private Catholic schools, and after the 9th grade, she began studying with a tutor at home. She was quite satisfied with this state of affairs. Beyoncé never felt like a part of the school team, and her only friends were the girls from the band. Even when Beyoncé was homeschooled, her homework was different. She watched videos of Michael Jackson instead of math, memorizing his moves and ideas that could be used on stage. I grew up hearing this particular scripture from James 2.17. Faith without work is dead. Vision and intention weren't enough. I had to put in the work. I committed to always being a student and always being open to growth. She also read a lot about the history of music to understand where and how Michael and Prince came from, how they were influenced by people like Jackie Wilson and James Brown. She was interested only in this, and she wanted to learn as much as possible. At that time, all the songs for Girl's Time were written by Tony Moe, a famous songwriter. But from the very beginning, he promoted the idea that girls should learn to write texts on their own. We had this exercise. We gathered the girls in a room, each had a pen and a notebook, and had to write at least a few lines. Time passed, and one by one, the girls gave up and left the room. When I came back, there was only Beyoncé with the finished text. Everyone else tried too, but Beyoncé took her work very seriously for a child. Even then, she wrote good lyrics, taught other girls parts as she wished, and also constantly sat next to sound producer Lonnie Jackson. She memorized his work and constantly asked about the meaning of certain buttons and wrote the answers in her notebook. At the beginning of 1991, the girls were organized for the first session in their life in a professional recording studio. Ironically, Beyonce had a congested nose that day, which made her voice sound different. In fact, the problem with the sinuses would haunt her for the rest of her life. Her bandmates recalled that she had a really stuffy nose all the time, and it was a constant problem. Right in the studio, Beyoncé would put a piece of paper on the floor, stand over it, and then just blow snot. Beyoncé, it's just disgusting, shouted everyone who was nearby, and she laughed and answered, I know, but if you want me to sing today, just put up with it. On that day, they recorded a song called Sunshine, which would later become their signature and first hit. Shortly after this recording, the girls were taken to a major talent festival in California. This performance promised to introduce them to a wide range of record company executives, so it was a chance to get their first major contract. Producers Deborah and Denise paid for the tickets not only for the girls, but also for their parents so that they could go with them and support their children. As the date approached, the girls rehearsed their songs day and night. The new program was called Boot Camp, which they rehearsed even during morning runs. They ran regularly and in order to train endurance for long performances on stage. Before the performance, Beyoncé's mother gave all the girls manicures and hairstyles in her salon. At a local clothing store, she purchased shiny white tuxedos with shoulder pads, silk blouses, and bow ties. When the girls were shopping for clothes, they passed by a shoe store and in the window they saw amazing boots that shone with a fluorescent glow. It turned out that they could not afford the shoes and the seller was not going to give a discount. 
Then Tina made a deal with them. The girls will arrange an impromptu performance in the store and lure customers to it. The seller agreed. The girls repeated their number, only without music, and soon a huge crowd gathered around them. Of course, the seller gave them a discount. When the girls were behind the scenes, they began to be noticeably nervous. They had to perform live in front of a large audience. Beyonce was more nervous than the others, and then her father, Matthew, said a phrase she would repeat before every performance. Quote, The only thing you can do out there is give it your best and leave the rest to the audience. When they were announced, the nervousness suddenly disappeared. They took the stage in their sleek white and purple costumes and looked nothing like a children's band. In the pauses between the verses, they addressed the audience, encouraged them to wave their hands and dance. That evening, Girls' Time became a real crowd favorite. The audience was on their feet as soon as they finished their final number. Matthew left the hall in an elegant suit and handed each of them a red rose. Well, <laughs> I guess if we keep on practicing and practicing and we keep on performing, every time we get better and the stage fright just fades away. Fades away. The performance was so successful that soon the girls were invited to record at one of the most famous studios in the country, Plant in the city of Sausalito. Such giants as Stevie Wonder, Fleetwood Mac, and Prince were constantly recorded there. The girls were jumping and squealing with happiness, just like their parents. The limited budget did not allow taking all the participants, so only Beyonce and Ashley, aka the main soloists, had to go. Interestingly, there was no competition or jealousy between them at that time. On the contrary, they gave each other advice and sincerely rejoiced at their successes. In California, a white limousine was waiting for these two nine-year-old girls, which took them to a five-star hotel. Recording at the plant studio became defining in Beyonce's career. In fact, as well as Ashley's career. Tony Moe wrote the song Blue Velvet for the girls, which had a complex melody and a fairly fast beat. Even an experienced vocalist would not immediately be able to master this composition. Not to mention children. In fact, Ashley faced problems at the start of the recording. For several hours in a row, she tried to tame Tony Moe's composition, while Beyonce sat on the other side of the studio and was nervous. She was annoyed that Ashley was messing around for so long since they had so many more songs to record. Then the producers decided to try a different approach and let Beyonce take the microphone. It was immediately apparent that she knew what to do with a complex arrangement, and in about 15 minutes, Beyonce recorded Blue Velvet. After this recording, Beyonce became the central figure of the band. The heads of the recording companies began to be interested specifically in her. Ashley took a back seat and received only a few small parts. Many were also interested in Latavia, who was also brought to the studio later to record rap parts for the finished songs. One of their producers, named Arnie Frager, sent the girls' recordings to Prince himself, with whom he had worked with in the past. Prince liked their songs and wanted to sign them to his label, Paisley Park. Despite the fact that six months ago there were no problems between the participants, now the tension was increasing day by day. As Beyonce became a more prominent figure, Ashley was pushed more and more into the background. Beyonce's father understood what was going on and made his move. He met with all the executive producers and was straight and forthright. Realizing that his daughter was becoming the star of the band and that everything would fall apart without her, he declared that he wanted to take part in managing the band. It was an ultimatum. For some time, the producers seriously thought it would be easier to get rid of Beyonce, but the majority was against it. In the end, everyone agreed, and Matthew got his way. According to the agreement, he became a co-manager and received half of all profits from the girls' time band. We weighed all of the options, and we felt that in the end, Beyonce was going to be a big enough star that this gamble would eventually pay off. However, this new deal was not so much about the money as it was about power. Matthew now had a say in all decisions. At that time, he was already making decent money and had a lot of time to manage the band. In the fall of 1992, Arnie Frager got girls' time to participate in the television talent-seeking program, Star Search. It was a big chance for the girls, as the show was the precursor to American Idol, where stars like Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera got their first break. A win would help them land a record deal. Thus, song choice was key, and that was where some disagreements arose. Part of the team wanted the band to sing Boyfriend, where Beyoncé and Ashley had the same length parts. However, part of the team believed that the bet should be made on Beyoncé and her solo performance. In the end, the decision was made to perform a number by Beyoncé, and that chose the song, That's the Way It Is in My City. 
The other girls got only small parts at the beginning and the end. Backstage, before their appearance on Star Search, the girls met with one of the show's producers, who explained that if they won, they would receive $100,000. <laughs> Not bad motivation, as for 12-year-olds. The show host introduced them as a young and promising band from Houston. When the lights were turned on, the girls took the stage and suffered their first setback. The performance wasn't a failure, but for the most part, the band looked like they needed more work. They got three out of five stars and went home broke. More than the girls, only Matthew was saddened by the defeat. After the performance on Star Search, Matthew approached the presenter and asked what he could advise the girls. He answered a banal thing, but it was said in time. The presenter said that during his life, he saw many children's tears on the stage, but success is achieved by those who do not complete the journey at the first failure. After the performance, Matthew realized that he should devote even more time to the band. Therefore, at the end of 1992, he dared to quit his high-paying job to devote himself fully to his daughter's band. Moreover, he enrolled at Houston Community College and enrolled in three courses in management related to show business. Also, after this performance, radical changes took place and Ashley left the band. For a long time, she felt that she was given much less attention and her parents saw the same. The other girls tried to protest her dismissal, but nothing worked out, and the girls realized for the first time what a cruel place show business was. After she left Girls Time, Ashley continued to work with Tony Moe and recorded at least 40 more songs with him. In 2004, she auditioned again for the Star Search show and failed again. However, she would soon begin working with Prince, and in 2006, she would tour with him promoting his album, 3721. For this album, she and Prince co-wrote the Grammy-nominated song, Beautiful, loved, and blessed. Her place in Girl's Time was soon replaced by another girl named Latoya Luckett. The updated lineup and the failure of the talent show prompted a name change. After much thought, Girl's Time became something fresh. Around this time, a producer named Daryl Simmons, the CEO of his own company, Silent Partner Productions, began to show interest in the band. He already had several successful projects, so he was actively looking for new talent to produce. The agreement with Silent Partner was signed and concluded on June 11, 1993, but the album release was not yet discussed. First, they had to perform on a big stage. At that time, the girls rehearsed a lot in Atlanta in Simmons' huge house. He turned it into a rehearsal base where the girls not only prepared their numbers, but also simply lived. The rehearsal schedule was so grueling that everyone had a nervous breakdown from time to time, but it paid off. The performance was impressive and much better than the previous one, but the main thing is that there were many people from different record labels in the audience. Simmons expected the phone to be bursting with good deals, but that didn't happen. Instead, he was criticized for the fact that the girls looked too mature and appeared in revealing outfits, which was not very appropriate given their age. Nevertheless, Sylvia Roon, chairman and CEO of Electra Records, took an interest in the band. In the 80s, the Los Angeles Times called her, quote, the most influential woman in the music business, for a good reason. Sylvia offered them a very good contract that included money to work, record songs, pay producers, and just keep everyone living in Atlanta. Unconditional Joy quickly turned to disappointment when it turned out that the label only wanted a four-person band. They wanted Beyonce, Kelly, Latoya, and someone else. Nikki, Nina, and Latavia had to audition to get the final spot. In the end, Latavia got it, and Nikki and Nina left the band. Soon, they also left show business, entered college, and became school teachers. They got married, had children, and they haven't talked to Beyonce to this day. The updated band was renamed again. This time, they were called The Dolls. By early 1995, the songs were finally finished for Elektra Records, but the label was still dragging their feet on releasing them. Sylvia did not really like what the girls came out with and considered the material to be mediocre. In addition, Beyonce's father called her every day and asked why nothing was happening. He was impatient, and this partly played a role in the fact that the label refused to release the songs. After hearing the news, the girls even went to the office on their own to talk to the label representatives, but they also failed to convince them. In short, the album was cancelled. The failure of this agreement put an end to dreams of money, and the financial situation of the Knowles family became unbearable. Matthew had invested all his time and savings into this business. They were constantly receiving letters from debt collectors in the mail, and several cases of late payments were pending in court. That affected the couple's relationship, so Tina and Matthew decided to live separately. 
Tina took Beyonce and Solange and moved into another house. Since money was not good, Tina worked in the salon more than ever. My mom worked until her toes were calloused and her feet were swollen. Not only at the salon, she also found time to make prom and wedding dresses. She took Solange and me to our dance classes and concerts, cooked us delicious food, and took us to church. Sunday was family day. She worked a lot and never stopped. Despite difficult life circumstances, Tina clung to religion. One time during this time, when Beyonce seemed particularly upset, Tina sat her down next to her and sang the old gospel hymn, Take My Hand, Lord Jesus. It was a moment Beyonce will never forget. In 2015, she will perform her version of the same song at the 57th Grammy Awards. Matthew, who was essentially left without a wife and children, was not going to give up. He'd already given his best to this cause, so there was nothing to lose. When it became clear that Elektra would not release their album, Matthew began to look for other options. He managed to meet Dwayne Wiggins, who was the founder of the band Tony, Tony, Tony. The popularity of his once successful band was declining, so he was looking for new artists and received a tape with girls' demo recordings. I signed them in 95, and then I'll it was just, it's just been like a treat ever since. I was like, you know, even most of the time in the studio with them, I was more like a fan because I knew this was a real group. Or with or with, with, with or without me, it was going to come to the forefront. Hey, hi. Hi. How are you doing? I have nothing to do with it. Yes, you do. I got that check out. Can you take it far away? He loved it, got fired up, and contacted Matthew to offer him a new deal. First, they had to change the name because the rights to the name The Dolls belonged to other people. The new and final name of the band was taken from the Bible, and the team was now called Destiny's Child. The new schedule was no less hectic than the previous ones, but they were all happy to be back in the studio after what happened in Atlanta. Eventually, some of the songs recorded in Wiggins Studios would end up on Teresa LaBarbera White's desk at Columbia Sony Records. This turn of events would prove to be a pivotal and defining moment in Beyoncé's life. Destiny's Child assigned an incredible seven-album deal with Columbia Sony. According to the contract, the budget for the first record was to be $85,000, not much in the music business, but incredible money for a children's band. The budget of the next was $500,000, the third $750,000. Thus, the scale continued to rise until the seventh album, the budget of which would reach a million dollars. We already mentioned a man named Rob Vissar in the Lady Gaga video. If you haven't seen it yet, we highly recommend this video. This music producer has written songs for Britney Spears, Whitney Houston, and Will Smith, but his career actually began when he worked on songs for Destiny's Child. He wrote the hit No 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 for them. Beyonce was the first to record. She listened to Fasari's demo all the way through, then listened to it again, taking notes in her notebook. Even then, she had a lot of experience in performing songs, so she finished all the verses in less than an hour. Few artists could have dreamed of a better opportunity to record their first album than Destiny's Child. Thanks to Matthew's persistence and determination, the girls were able to work with some of the most popular producers and musicians at the time. One of the first disagreements Dwayne had with Matthew Knowles concerned the vocal parts in the songs he produced. The producers wanted all four girls to be represented on stage equally, but Matthew was much more interested in promoting his daughter and wanted to see her as the main character. It says a lot about Beyonce that she was always on the side of the producers and didn't want to be the main figure if it hurt others. One day, Dwayne asked her to record vocals for a song while Kelly, Latavia, and Latoya just watched from the other side of the glass. She asked, quote, Why am I singing it alone when the other girls can sing something too? This annoyed her so much that she forced the producers to split the parts equally. Despite this innate sense of justice, Beyonce couldn't help but notice that she was indeed getting a lot more attention. In any case, she couldn't help but like it. By January 1997, they wrote most of the songs for the first album. In total, they recorded more than 40 tracks and then selected the 13 best of them. July 1st, 1997 saw the release of Destiny's Child's first song, Killing Time, written by Dwayne Wiggins and Tara Stinson. Though it was not released as a single, but as a soundtrack to the film Men in Black. Sitting on the stairway, hoping that you it's interesting that at first the producers did not want to give the song to the soundtrack because no one could predict the phenomenal success of Men in Black. As the film quickly became the box office leader, the soundtrack album was also a huge success. 
In total, it spent two weeks at number one on the Billboard Top 200 chart and went triple platinum, meaning it was sold three million times. Although Killing Time wasn't released as a single, it set the stage nicely for the next song, No No No. This composition was released as a single and became a hit not only in the USA, but also in Europe. Unbelievable to us that after all this hard work, fame came overnight. We thought we'd have to put out at least a few more songs before we had a hit, but we never thought it would happen the first time. The successful soundtrack and single was followed by the album of the same name, Destiny's Child. It was released on February 17, 1998 and very quickly soared to number 4 on the Billboard 200 chart. It stayed there for 26 weeks and sold 1 million copies in the US and 3 million worldwide. In addition, this album brought the girls their first award, the Best R&B Soul Album of the Year at the Soul Train Lady of Soul Awards. In the spring of 1998, Destiny's Child embarked on their first major tour, opening for Boys to Men. Around this time, Beyonce's mother officially began working as the band's stylist. She had done their hair before, but now their looks were entirely up to her. In general, in this regard, the girls were completely independent. Tina only listened to their ideas and turned them into stage images. The girls cut out pictures of women in the clothes they liked from magazines, and Tina, in turn, sewed these clothes. And although the first album sold quite well, its sales did not live up to the label's hopes. That is why it was not known whether the path of Destiny's Child would continue. The agreement with Columbia provided for seven albums, but the label could change its mind at any time. Nevertheless, the band was given another chance, and work on the next record began. Unlike the debut release, where Beyoncé co-wrote only one song while working on The Writings on the Wall, she wrote 11 of the 15 songs. In this, she was helped by a whole galaxy of popular songwriters and producers of that time. Among them were Rodney Dark Child Jerkins, Kevin Sheikspear Briggs, Candy Burris, Missy Elliott, Daryl Simmons, and Dwayne Wiggins. In preparation for the second release, the girls sat down with notebooks and pens and took copious notes about what they liked and didn't like about the debut record. For example, Beyoncé wrote that there was a lot of adult material on the first album, but they themselves were teenagers, and they wanted to sing about something teenage. It's interesting that not only the girls learned from experienced producers, but they also learned from them. The recording of the second album was a unique phenomenon, a kind of jazz improvisation. Sometimes Beyoncé would pull out her CD stash of instrumental tracks, listen to them, and then decide which ones could be tweaked. Performers came to the studio and felt at home there. They watched TV, ate pizza, and even wrote songs. The process was as follows. Beyoncé could write most of the lyrics, then one girl would add a word, another would add a phrase, and so on, until the song was complete. There have been many archival videos from those times. The Writings on the Wall was released on August 14, 1999, and debuted at number 6 on the Billboard 200. The album earned the band six Grammy nominations and two wins for the song Say My Name. Sales were also phenomenal, transforming the band from up-and-comers to true industry stars in an instant, with the album selling 10 million copies in the U.S. On October 22, 1999, Destiny's Child began a tour supporting TLC, another girl band that the girls had long admired. Although the concerts were organized in the best way, it was during these tours that the performers began to realize that they were no longer one. The band split, with Beyoncé and Kelly in one camp and Latavia and Latoya in another. This happened because Latavia and Latoya began to notice that they were not treated as warmly as Beyoncé or Kelly. It was clear that the producer was Beyoncé's father, but the affection for his own daughter was too obvious. Moreover, the girls understood that they were making millions, but their own accounts showed rather modest numbers. Beyoncé has always been the center of attention, not only on stage, but also during interviews and photo shoots. The last straw was that one day Beyoncé got a brand new Bentley, although before that she was driving a new Jaguar. The parents of the other girls demanded income statements, but Matthew refused. The atmosphere worsened and very soon turned into lawsuits against Beyoncé's father. In 1999, Latoya Luckett and Latavia Robertson tried to terminate their contract with their manager, claiming that he was unfairly dividing the band's income and was preparing grounds for their dismissal. 
The girls were not going to leave the band, but when the video for the new song Say My Name was released, they saw that two new names appeared in the band, Michelle Williams and Farrah Franklin. Apparently, Matthew planned to replace those who were not satisfied with anything, and in the end, it happened. And although during that period the band constantly suffered from upheavals, that did not become an obstacle for their further success. They grew into a true phenomenon of pop culture, becoming one of the most successful bands. The Writings on the Wall became one of the 10 best-selling albums of 2000. Destiny's Child began opening concerts for stars such as Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera. However, all these scandals drove Beyoncé into depression. After all, she was just a teenager. For several weeks, she hardly left her room and remembered how beautifully everything had begun. There were no quarrels or lawsuits then. Several times, she went out just to perform on stage and then come back. And although Beyoncé understood the injustice towards other girls, she also perfectly understood that a significant percentage of their success belonged to her. From the age of nine, Beyoncé was constantly offered to perform solo, but she did not want to offend other members of the band and always refused. When Destiny's Child released their first release, Beyoncé received many offers to write movie soundtracks and release solo albums, but she remained loyal to her band. In one interview, the singer said that her personal success was never as important to her as the success of Destiny's Child. But now, she didn't care. Beyoncé made a decision one morning. She first called the band's attorney, Ken Hertz, to tell him the news. She then faxed a former letter to Don Lenner, the president of her label. The decision was to leave the band Destiny's Child. The label supported Beyoncé, knowing very well that she would sell an even better solo. However, no one was going to give up such a famous name as Destiny's Child. While these quarrels were going on, the band became even more popular, so Latavia and Latoya were quickly replaced by others. Show business did not tolerate sentimentality, and at that time, Beyoncé understood it even better. In the updated lineup, they recorded the song Independent Women Part 1, which became the soundtrack of the upcoming film Charlie's Angels. It was released in the fall of 2000 and stayed at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart for 11 consecutive weeks. While the recording of the new album, Survivor, was going on, Beyoncé began to accept offers and got a role in the movie Carmen, a hip hopera, where her partner was the actor Mekki Pfeiffer. At first, the management was skeptical. Yes, Beyoncé was beautiful and talented, but could she act? It turned out that she felt quite comfortable on the set, thanks in large part to her previous work in music videos. Beyoncé seemed fully prepared to give her best in the movie as well. Today, some critics consider her acting debut to be superior to all her subsequent film roles. It was the beginning of January 2002. Beyoncé was in her 20s, finishing songs for Destiny's Child's third album and about to leave for Los Angeles. There, she got another role in the film Austin Powers in Goldmember with Mike Myers. This was her second acting role. A few months earlier, Beyoncé met a rapper named Jay-Z. This happened thanks to the song I Got That by the rapper Emile. Matthew Knowles negotiated a deal with Jay-Z's label to have Beyoncé appear on the record. This would help expand her audience and promote her as a solo artist. But something more happened. A few days after the recording, Jay called Beyoncé and said that he admired her work and wanted to talk to her about a possible duet. At the time, Jay-Z was one of the most successful rappers in the industry, arguably the premier hip-hop artist. It's not hard to imagine how intrigued Beyoncé was by this possible duet, and quickly agreed. Before Beyoncé, Jay-Z went from woman to woman. He was once in a relationship with singer Blue Cantrell. He also dated the deceased singer Alaya and actress Rosario Dawson. It wasn't love at first sight between Jay-Z and Beyoncé, but they were very different. One aspect of his life that Beyoncé didn't understand was his materialistic side. Everything revolved around money for him, and he would be the first to admit it out loud. He always wore designer clothes, had platinum and gold jewelry, owned private jets and expensive cars. All this screamed success and pushed Beyoncé away. Unlike Jay-Z, Beyoncé was constantly saving for a rainy day during this period of her life and didn't even realize how rich she was. Her father dealt with money. For example, she could turn down a $2,000 jacket without knowing if she could afford it. And while she hesitated standing in front of the store window, her father bought her a second apartment in the most expensive area of Miami. And today, her fortune reaches $500 million. 
From late 2000 to early 2001, Destiny's Child recorded their third album, Survivor. The structure of the record has completely changed. Beyonce has gained much more power and control over the record. It was she who decided what was included in the album and what was not. Survivor appeared in stores in the spring of 2001 and immediately entered the first place at the Billboard 200. It sold more than 600,000 copies in its first week. Even when the band first became popular, many had a fair question. When will they start singing solo? It seemed inevitable. Beyonce was already on her way to a solo career thanks to Carmen and the Austin Powers movie. For the last film, Beyonce wrote not only the main theme, but also the song Work It Out, which became the main composition on the soundtrack album. This was her first step towards a solo career. Unfortunately, it was not successful. The song didn't even make the Billboard Hot 100. Adding fuel to the fire was the fact that the other members of the band were releasing solo albums and had even more success than Beyonce. Despite the fact that the band's history was coming to an end, Destiny's Child World Tour was more than successful. All tickets were sold out, and the singers visited Australia, Japan, France, Germany, Holland, and Sweden. The schedule was filled not only with concert dates, but also with constant appearances on television and radio. On this tour, Beyonce became very close to Jay-Z, with whom they constantly talked on the phone and complained about each other's lives. They were from the same world, experiencing the same thing. In the summer of 2002, they had the opportunity to spend a vacation in the south of France. They lived in the best hotels, dined in the best restaurants, and thought about joint projects. Beyonce will connect her life with this person, so it's worth talking in more detail about who Jay-Z is and why she chose him. In fact, his influence on hip-hop and music in general is hard to overstate. Therefore, if you want a separate issue about Sean Carter, whom everyone knows as Jay-Z, write in the comments. And for now, briefly about him. Sean Carter was born in 1969 in Brooklyn. He spent his childhood in a poor neighborhood where he was surrounded by drug addicts and gang members. At the age of 12, Sean shot his older brother with a gun for stealing money from him. The bullet hit him in the shoulder, and the brother did not press charges. From childhood, he was forced to sell illegal substances until he met a rapper named Jazz O. It was he who took the young Sean Carter under his wing and they started rapping together. Success came to Jay-Z in the mid-90s when he released his first album and founded his own label, Rockefeller Records. But the moment he met Beyonce, Jay-Z was already a superstar. His releases sold millions of copies, and his label was one of the most influential in the entire music industry. In the spring of 2002, Jay-Z called Kanye West to ask him to write music for a possible duet with Beyonce. Coincidentally, West had a great beat where he sampled Tupac Shakur's Me and My Girlfriend. In August, Jay and Beyonce went into the studio to record their first song together. Shortly thereafter, in October 2002, it would become the lead single from his album, The Blueprint 2. Considering Beyonce's first solo release was the flop Work It Out, no one could have predicted a sudden duet with one of the industry's most famous rappers. Actually, it immediately became obvious to everyone that the duo is not only creative. Despite the fact that on almost all albums of Destiny's Child, Beyonce's voice sounded more often than others, she was still not considered an independent author. The songs were not released under her name, and this had both pros and cons. Beyonce wasn't responsible for the failures, but she didn't get the attention she deserved when they were successful. That is why, when writing a solo album, she felt a lot of pressure. No one guaranteed success. It was still a game of roulette. When it became known that Beyonce was writing an album, hundreds and thousands of ideas, songs, and instrumentals began to arrive in her mail. Every producer in the world understood that Beyonce could make them famous and rich, so everyone wanted to work with her. For her part, Beyonce wanted to create an album that could demonstrate that she had grown as both a songwriter and a producer. With this album, they were to be assisted by the best producers of the time, reggae star Sean Paul, Luther Vandross, Big Boy from Outkast, and Missy Elliott. Jay-Z was also a big influence, appearing on two songs, Crazy in Love and That's How You Like. I worked with Jay-Z on his album, so I asked him to do the same. We work really well together in the studio. Hip-hop and R&B is always a great collaboration. There's a male point of view and a female point of view. Men relate, women relate. 
However, when Beyonce showed the nearly finished album to her label, they were skeptical. Everyone remembered her recent failure with Work It Out, and the success of the duet with Jay-Z was not enough to release an album immediately. She was told that she didn't have a single hit. In fact, there were at least five of them. Fortunately, while writing the album, Beyonce met the very right person who changed everything for her musically. His name was Rich Harrison. He was a successful songwriter and producer who worked on albums by Kelly Rowe, Mary J. Blige, and others. Almost every successful songwriter has a few songs that they've been saving for years, waiting for the right artist. In December 2002, Harrison received an invitation to join Beyonce's project and showed her a sample of her song in the studio. Beyonce wasn't impressed at all. The sample seemed old-fashioned and too old-school, even for Jay-Z. But after two or three times, the opinion changed. At night, Jay-Z came to the studio, Beyonce sang her chorus to him, and he went into the booth and read his verses. It's interesting that Jay-Z often did not even have lyrics, but simply improvised and made millions from it. As a result, this song came out. Beyonce's first solo album, Dangerously in Love, was released in the summer of 2003 and became an undeniable triumph. In the first week, almost 400,000 copies were sold, and in total, 12 million copies and downloads. The singles entered the charts without problems, where they stayed for dozens of weeks. During awards season, the album got every possible trophy around the world, including Grammys for Best R&B Album, Grammys for Best Duo, and Best Female Vocal Performance. With this album, Beyoncé's career really started to take off, and there was no going back. At this moment, Beyoncé could be close to star disease because the success itself went into her hands. Fortunately, she overcame this as a child when she performed in her first band. Her mother helped her in this, and Beyoncé remembered her lesson for the rest of her life. I remember after our first single on the radio, I was a little over the moon. I felt so mega popular. Once we went to a record store with my mother and I started singing. I just didn't want to hear what my mother told me, and my song was playing in the speakers, and I was singing. People looked around. That's Beyonce! And then my mother slapped me so hard that I actually saw stars around my head. Many celebrities create an image that is different from who they are in real life. Sometimes the image does not interfere with the true identity of a person because they are so closely related. Like Madonna, for example. Her sassy stage persona is closely related to who she is in real life, but sometimes there are contradictions between the image and the person. To remove them, people create their alter egos. Beyoncé calls her second personality Sasha Fierce. This is a fictional character, but also a personality that was very different from who Beyoncé really was. According to her, Sasha Fierce first showed herself on stage one evening when she tore off expensive diamond rings and threw them at the audience. They cost $250,000. Many years ago, I named my alter ego Sasha, and it's something that stuck. So when I was trying to, to decide the title of my album, I realized it had two different sounds. One represented who I really am, and one sounded like my alter ego. So I decided to split it into two, because I, I feel like Sasha is a big treat for my fans. Um, it's definitely exciting being able to have an excuse to be so over the top. <laughs> um, and, and I think um, you definitely hear the difference. I try to keep Sasha on the stage. I absolutely keep Sasha on the stage, and now she has a last name. She's Sasha Fierce. Also, the appearance of Sasha Fierce can be identified at the moment when Beyonce underwent breast augmentation surgery. Beyonce herself did not confirm this, but fastidious fans noticed more than once how the appearance of their famous singer changed. One aspect of Sasha Fierce's look was best described by Beyonce's longtime makeup artist, Billy B. Beyonce has been overly critical since she was a child. She felt pressured from all sides. By creating an alter ego, she created an entity on which to place some of the blame for a bad performance or for strange actions. Sasha Fierce had not only a different character, but also an appearance. If breast enlargement can be just a rumor, then other changes are easier to notice. For example, how Beyonce's nose has shrunk over the years. Some representatives of the tabloids even took comments from plastic surgeons to find out if the singer really changed her appearance surgically. Many of them agree that she really could have narrowed her nose and adjusted its tip, but Beyonce herself does not comment on this matter. 
Another favorite topic of the tabloids is whether Beyonce had liposuction or did she achieve this result through exercise and healthy eating. I'm young. I don't think plastic surgery is okay right now, but when I'm 57, who knows what I'm gonna say. I don't judge anybody though, if it's something that makes them feel better, then fine. Beyonce Knowles started 2004 on a high note by purchasing a stunning estate for $1.5 million. 10,000 square feet, five bedrooms and five bathrooms. The windows faced the green hills and the house itself was located in a closed cottage town. Most of 2004 was dedicated to finishing another studio album for Destiny's Child, their first since 2001. Also, Beyonce was finishing filming another movie called Pink Panther. Beyonce was originally intended to release a follow-up to her first album, but when she was approached to work with Destinies again, she wanted to reconnect with them. This album was called Destiny Fulfilled and was a successful comeback of the once popular band. The album took the second place in the Billboard 200 and Destiny's Child went on a new, big tour that lasted almost six months. Despite a good album, it was during this tour that the band announced that they were calling it quits. After returning from the tour, Beyonce began work on the next album. In May 2006, she called Columbia Sony and asked them to reserve one of the studios for her. She also provided a list of songwriters and producers she would like to work with. All this was confidential. No one was supposed to know that she was writing new material. Such authors as Pharrell Williams, Rich Harrison, Sean Garrett, and others took part in the recording of the new album. In exactly three weeks, Beyonce wrote the album, which was released on her birthday and was named Birthday. The recording process was also unusual. She gathered all the songwriters and beat makers in the studio, allocated a room for each of them where they wrote tracks. She went from room to room and controlled the process. In fact, this type of multitasking recording was a throwback to a bygone era. In the 60s and 70s, labels often practiced this hit factory approach. They regularly assembled teams of authors and producers who would work on a specific project. This created a spirit of competition. Everyone tried to surpass not only other authors, but also themselves. The disadvantages were that this process contributed to conflicts, and the atmosphere in such studios was not friendly. What was exciting about the B-Day album, namely its spontaneity, was also its weakness. The authors were talented, but often they did not even try to go beyond hip-hop, which was later criticized by music critics. It was Beyoncé's first truly independent album. Even her father, who has been monitoring her every move since childhood, did not know that she was preparing a new album. Despite the fact that the opinions of critics were divided, the album and its singles collected all possible trophies. Birthday won a Grammy for Best R&B Album. In December 2007, Beyoncé began work on her third solo album. Although the previous record was multi-platinum worldwide, some critics, like Beyoncé herself, felt that something was still missing. An interesting concept was invented for the new album. It consisted of two discs. The first was called I Am and contained mostly odes about love and relationships. The second disc was called Sasha Fierce and contained more dance tracks and more hip-hop. Even in this aspect, there was a noticeable difference between Beyoncé and her alter ego. I want people to see me from different angles. Here, there is cheerful music for dancing. There is also thoughtful, passionate, and serious music. I take the risk. I'm not afraid, and my music proves it. There are no labels or stigmas in her sound. It is me, and I'm so excited to share it with the world. The song Single Ladies immediately went beyond the hit, becoming a real cultural phenomenon. It's also interesting that the clip was shot almost without a budget and became one of the most successful in her career. In total, the album will sell 8 million copies and Beyoncé will receive a record 6 Grammy wins. At the time, it was the most awards received by a female artist in one evening. The year 2008 was also devoted to filming in the biographical film Cadillac Records. Beyoncé played the role of blues singer Etta James there. The film tells the story of an immigrant from Poland who's tired of poverty and dreams of his future wife driving a Cadillac. He owns a nightclub and later opens a record label and invites black musicians and makes some stars. Racial inequality was massive in those days, and the film shows all the problems faced by blacks in the 50s. Nevertheless, it was this studio and the dream of one Polish immigrant that gave the world many great stars, such as Etta James or Chuck Berry. Beyoncé prepared for the role for a long time. Considering that Etta James had a serious addiction to illegal substances, Beyoncé tried to explore this side of the famous singer's life. 
Of course, she did not start using, but for several weeks she settled in the rehabilitation center Phoenix House. I never tried drugs in my life, so I didn't know about it all. It was hard to go there. In the beginning, I didn't want to offend anyone. I didn't want to ask the wrong questions or seem judgmental. They were so honest, though, and I'm so thankful. I don't think I could have understood that level of pain or need. What they do there is amazing. I learned a lot about life and myself. Perhaps it was this experience that helped her play out of James so well. As a sign of her gratitude, Beyonce donated $4 million of her royalties to the center. My love has come along. In addition, in the same year, Beyonce took part in the filming of the film Obsessed with Idris Elba in the main role. After recording a successful album and starring in commercially successful films, Beyonce decided it was time to take care of her personal life. On April 4, 2008, Beyonce and Sean Carter got married in New York. It was a small ceremony for only 40 guests. Contrary to their often provocative public images, Beyonce and Jay chose a traditional wedding ceremony. Beyonce wore a white silk dress and her hair was elegantly pulled back into a chignon. Her engagement ring deserves special attention. This is Lorraine Schwartz's $5 million diamond ring. They were married by the Knoll's longtime family priest, Pastor Rudy Rosmus. All the women were dressed in white and the men in black. The ceremony was held secretly, and people found out about their marriage only six months later. I just think it's really a part of your life that you have to keep to yourself. You have to do it or you'll go crazy. You have to have something sacred for yourself and for the people around you. On January 18, 2009, Beyoncé performed at the Lincoln Memorial in honor of the inauguration of the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. She also sang a cover version of Etta James' song, At Last, when Obama and his wife, Michelle, danced for the first time as President and First Lady of America. Found a dream that I could... It's interesting that Etta James was not just impressed by this performance, but on the contrary, she was angry. In one interview, she said, I can't stand Beyonce. She has no business up there singing up there on a big old president day. Gonna be singing my song that I've been singing forever. But I tell you that woman he had singing for him, singing my song, she's gonna get her ass whooped. By the way, there's a whole list of stars who do not like Beyonce very much. It's quite possible that it's mutual. On this list, you can find the rapper Lil Wayne or Donald Trump who did not like Beyonce's performance at the Super Bowl. 50 Cent, Azealia Banks, Wendy Williams. Everyone has their own reasons, but Beyoncé does not leave their outbursts without attention. She often has something to say to them as well. She doesn't like Kim Kardashian and criticized Kanye West's choice from the beginning. Like, Kim didn't fit in at all in their company, where they were only talented musicians. After getting married, Beyoncé took a break for six months, which she devoted to herself and her husband. During this hiatus, she gave an interview where she revealed that she killed Sasha Fierce because she no longer needed an alter ego. She's grown out of it and is now personally responsible for her actions. She moved on and finally fired her father as manager. He took care of her from the age of eight, but it was time to go his own way. In addition, there were rumors that he was misappropriating a lot of her money. Matthew later sued Beyonce's former contract promoter, Live Nation, alleging that they damaged his relationship with his daughter with these false statements. Judging by the fact that Beyonce responded with an audit and did not add up to a large amount, the claims were true. After a hiatus, during which Beyoncé simply rested, she returned to the studio to record a new album. It was released in 2001 and was called Four. It was the first release where her father was not listed as a co-author and it marked a new era in her work, an era of independence. About 17 authors and producers worked on the project, which was recorded for a whole year. Released in June 2011, Four debuted at number one. Although it received its share of accolades, it sold only 3 million copies and was the weakest of all her records. Oddly enough, the album's standout track, Love on Top, only peaked at number 20 in the United States, and the album's final single, End of Time, didn't even enter the charts. Perhaps the fact that people were not discussing her album as much as her figure played a role. Someone believed that she simply stopped working out in the gym, and someone assumed that Beyoncé was pregnant. In order not to breed gossip, Beyoncé made a statement but it is better to see it for yourself. In this way, she confirmed her pregnancy, but also gave rise to strange rumors. Some people believed that the stomach was fake. It was rumored that Beyonce was not actually pregnant, but used a surrogate mother to carry the child for them. 
Rumors like this appear regularly. There are still people who claim that Beyonce belongs to the Illuminati, although there's no evidence for this. Maybe you've also heard some strange rumors about famous people. Share these conspiracy theories in the comments. Rumors about pregnancy hurt most. People didn't know it, but when Beyonce released a documentary about her life, she revealed that she had a miscarriage a few years earlier. To think that I would be that vain. I respect mothers and women so much, and to be able to experience bringing a child into this world, if you're lucky and fortunate enough to experience that, I would never ever take that for granted. I mean, it's the most powerful thing you can do in your life, and especially after losing a child, the pain and trauma from that just makes it mean so much more to get an opportunity to bring life into the world. It's something that you have to respect. The birth of the child took place in complete secrecy. For that matter, they installed dark glass in the room with the newborn so that no one could take a picture of their baby. Beyonce even registered under a different name and gave birth to a daughter on January 7, 2011, whom she named Blue Ivy Carter. During pregnancy, Beyonce gained 55 pounds, which she hurried to lose immediately after the birth of Ivy. She even announced a concert three months after giving birth, as if setting a deadline for herself. With strict diets and constant training, Beyonce achieved her goal, but she also promised to give herself more time next time to rest and not think about being overweight. As for the child, Beyonce promised herself to follow the same approach to education as her parents. No matter what Ivy wants to do in the future, she will support her. This is manifested in everything. For example, in one interview, Beyonce said that when Ivy has childish tantrums, she often lets her lose her temper. Beyonce told relatives that she wanted her daughter to cry when she felt the need and to be free to express her emotions. After giving birth, Beyonce not only hit the gym, she also spent a lot of time in the studio. For someone who spends most of their life under scrutiny, the solitude of the recording studio is the most precious time. As an artist, she has always enjoyed creating her music and has even admitted that she enjoyed the process of creating it more than what happened to the music afterwards. Moreover, she has dozens, maybe even thousands of songs that the public has never heard and may never hear. In general, most of Beyonce's songs are written by herself, but if we look at the list of authors on each album, we will see dozens and sometimes hundreds of names. Why so? For example, the album Lemonade, released in 2016, could boast of a huge number of authors. There were 72 of them. The truth is that many of these names are not co-authors in the traditional sense. They do not sit with Beyonce in the studio and do not write lyrics for her. It's about intellectual property, primarily the samples used by Beyonce. For example, the outro of Hold Up uses a small snippet from Soulja Boy's 2008 song Turn My Swag On. In accordance with intellectual property law, all authors of this track must be credited. That's why there are sometimes several dozen authors. Moreover, such a practice is primarily an expression of respect for all musicians whose works the artist refers to in their own work. For her next album, Beyoncé realized she couldn't just release another collection of well-produced but generic songs. She needed to do something that would cause a sensation. I have a lot to prove with this work, not only to others, but to myself. After parting ways with Matthew, Beyoncé spent the last couple of years mulling over the idea of an album that would be experimental, not only from a musical standpoint, but also from a marketing standpoint. It usually goes something like this. The label decides when the album will go on sale, turning out singles to drum up interest for the upcoming record. Then the label sends the artist on a promotional tour. They shoot a music video for each single, and only after that, release the record. Beyoncé wondered what would happen if things were done differently. In the summer of 2012, Beyoncé's eccentric plan went into execution mode. At first, she rented a large house in the Hamptons on Long Island. Beyoncé set up a professional studio there and then invited about a dozen authors and musicians to live with her around the clock. The idea was that she would be able to relax with her husband and newborn baby while at the same time brainstorming musical ideas. Some kind of a working vacation. Servants and chefs were hired so her guests could do whatever they wanted. They swam in the pool relaxed, played games, and made music for Beyoncé's upcoming album. The album was positioned as a visual one, that is, a music video had to be shot for each of the songs. All this was done under conditions of secrecy, and the people who starred in those videos did not even know what they were participating in. Finally, without prior announcement and without advertising, in the early morning of December 13, 2013, she released an album called Beyoncé with 14 songs and 17 short films that highlighted the content of this album. Three songs immediately became hits, 
Blow, which was produced by Pharrell Williams, and Drunk in Love, which was produced primarily by Timbaland in a track called XO. The entire album received full radio play, which was unheard of these days. With this album, Beyonce revolutionized the process of releasing popular music. Without any promotion or marketing platform, she released an album only available for online download. By the end of 2014, the album had sold more than 5 million copies worldwide. Although none of the singles reached number one on the Bill Hot 100, it didn't matter. The album sold nearly a million copies in its first week alone, making it the fastest selling album in iTunes history. There was a very unpleasant story that came out with one single. But before we continue, we want to ask you to subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell so you don't miss the next video. Each video takes a lot of time to create, so we need your feedback and support. This is a good deal. A subscription and a like from you, and even more good videos from us. Thank you, and let's move on. The song XO was released as a single, and Beyonce immediately received harsh criticism. The fact is that in the song, she used a six-second fragment of a live report that was recorded during the disaster of the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986. The crew chief's widow, June Rogers, said it was very difficult for her emotionally to hear her husband's voice. According to her, it was the same as using the video of the Kennedy assassination or the 9-11 tragedy. NASA also issued a statement and condemned Beyonce for this technique. The statement said that the Challenger disaster is a tragic reminder that space exploration doesn't come without sacrifices and that one cannot thoughtlessly use this memory for artistic effect. Beyonce herself rejected all the accusations and replied that the song authors included an excerpt of the report in the song as a tribute to the fallen crew members and as a sign that they will never be forgotten. Professionally, the album release was a huge achievement. The singer proved that she can stand on her own feet without her father. Although the past was the past, she now knew for sure that the future held great promise. During 2014, Beyonce was definitely at the top of her career. She doubled her earnings, earning $115 million, up from $53 million in the past. This explosion was caused not only by a successful album, but also by two major tours. Also, constant sponsorship deals brought money, not to mention her perfume line, which would bring her almost half a billion dollars in just three years. The following year, Beyoncé was busy with her own label, Parkwood Entertainment. She signed up many young women that she was going to care for, just as Deborah and Denise had once cared for her. Today, besides Beyoncé herself, singers such as Chloe and Holly, as well as Ingrid Burley and Sophie Beam are signed to the label. I started my own company when I decided to manage myself. It was important that I didn't go to some big management company. I felt like I wanted to follow the footsteps of Madonna and be a powerhouse and have my own empire and show other women when you get to this point in your career, you don't have to go sign with someone else and share your money and your success. You do it yourself. Back then, Beyonce wanted a company that put art and creativity first, and for women to play key roles here at a time when the industry was still dominated by men. Beyonce was looking for collaborators who weren't jaded by the corporate world and weren't afraid to experiment, who would challenge her but wouldn't forbid her. Also, songs that Beyonce recorded with Jay-Z began to be released under this label. Their family duo is called The Carters, and so far has several tours and one album under the name Everything Is Love. 2016 was no less productive for Beyonce than the previous two. Already at the beginning of the year, she released a new single and a music video for it, and also announced the recording of a new album. The live premiere of the single took place at Super Bowl 50. Beyonce's sixth studio album premiered soon on HBO. It also became visual, but now there were not only music videos for each song, but also an hour-long film. Conceptually, this album is a woman's journey to self-discovery and healing. In the US, Lemonade debuted at number one on the Billboard 200. This was another record, and Beyonce became the first artist in history to have all six albums debut at number one. Another record was that 12 of her songs were on the charts at the same time. This record was held by Taylor Swift, who had 11 songs. The album deals with the theme of betrayal. It describes the experiences of a woman who found out about her lover's infidelity, from anger to apathy, from desolation to forgiveness. The name refers to the American proverb, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. 
These experiences are described in such a believable and detailed manner that many have wondered who exactly it was written about. Perhaps Beyonce has never been as candid as she is on this record in her entire career. But Lemonade is not so much about the betrayal itself as about finding yourself, disappointment in others, and most importantly, about great and true love for the sake of which you can overcome everything, even betrayal. It is not known for sure if there was cheating in their relationship, but Beyonce and Jay-Z remain together to this day. If they had any crisis, they successfully overcame it. The best proof of this is that on June 12, 2017, Beyonce gave birth to twins, a son and a daughter. The boy was named Sir Carter, and the girl was named Ruby Carter. After the birth of twins, Beyonce weighed about 100 kilograms. In April 2018, she had to perform at the Coachella Festival, so she urgently took up weight loss again. Beyonce severely limited herself in food. She refused bread, carbohydrates, sugar, milk, meat, fish, and alcohol. The basis of the diet included cereals, fruits, and vegetables. She was in a bad mood from such food, but the performance paid for itself. Beyonce's last album to date was released in 2022 and was called Renaissance. It's dedicated to all the pioneers who stood at the origins of dance culture, as well as to all those whose contributions have gone unrecognized for too long. The main leitmotif of the album can be called a simple but right idea. A free person is free to have any appearance. They can dance and love as they please. Queen B won four Grammy Awards for this album. In total, taking into account the new awards, Beyonce now has 32 Grammys, which is a record among all artists. But it looks like there's Beyonce's personal hater on the jury. Otherwise, it's very difficult to explain why, in more than 20 years of a brilliant career, she, the heiress of Aretha Franklin, James Brown, and Whitney Houston, has never received the main prize for album, song, or record of the year. Maybe this is one of the conspiracy theories, but we think she still has a long way to go. What about Beyonce today? Today, Beyoncé Giselle Knowles Carter is a very successful artist. According to the results of 2018, she took third place in the ranking of the highest paid singers. Her income for 2018 was $60 million. Her money comes from her highly successful catalog of songs, and she's also a shareholder in the Tidal streaming service, which is owned by Jay-Z. In addition, Beyoncé has a brand of sportswear called Ivy Park. In 2016, Beyonce and her company invested $150,000 in Sidestep, an app for selling souvenirs. In general, the service has attracted almost 2 million investments, and with its help, they sell merch of completely different stars. She also has unusual hobbies. For example, during the quarantine due to the COVID pandemic, Beyonce suddenly became interested in beekeeping. And this is not a joke. This may sound unusual, but I've had two beehives in my house for a while now. In total, there are already about 80,000 bees, which produce several hundred cans of honey per year. I started doing it because of my daughters. Blue and Ruby often have allergies, and honey has many healing properties. In addition, the singer recently created a new hair care line called Secret. For the title, she took the ending of her name, Say, and made it the beginning of the word sacred to create Sacred. Quote, The relationship we have with our hair is such a deeply personal journey. She explained, quote, from spending my childhood in my mother's salon to my father applying oil on my scalp to treat my psoriasis, these moments have been sacred to me. Nowadays, Beyonce, Jay-Z, and their three children live in California. Not so long ago, they bought the most expensive house in the entire state and paid $200 million for it. The house is located on the ocean in Malibu and occupies an area of almost 34,000 square feet. It has everything, including an absolutely happy family with children. Beyonce's path began in childhood and continues today. Over the years, she has won almost all the awards that an artist, actress, and businesswoman can have. She's called the Queen for a reason, and today she occupies her rightful place in the history of music. My wish is for my 40s to be fun and full of freedom. I want to feel the same freedom I feel on stage every day of my life. I want to explore aspects of myself I haven't had time to discover and to enjoy my husband and my children. I want to travel without working. I want this next decade to be about celebration, joy, and giving and receiving love. I want to give all the love I have to the people who love me back. 
If you enjoy the video, please like and subscribe. We try to make long and interesting stories that inspire and partially reveal the success formula of great musicians. Look for other formulas on our channel. There are many stories, and soon there will be even more. Click on the video that appeared on your screen, and a huge thank you for watching to the end. You are watching the Inco Stories channel. See you soon.